Thank you for the invitation. And, yeah. Sorry? You just said uh, that we are being recorded. Okay, yeah, yeah, it, it's fine, it's fine. Nothing to, nothing to hide. <laughs> so, um, so um, it's, I'm really happy to, uh, to be talking in this seminar. And as Mina said, it's not so easy to go to San Francisco, but now I can go <laughs> virtually. So, so I, Mina asked me to talk a little bit about uh, quantum curves. So I decided to give more like a review talk. So I, I won't discuss many new developments. I will point out uh, some uh, interesting new things here and there. But this is mostly going to be like a more pedagogical talk, uh, summarizing some of the developments on quantum curves, uh, at least from my point of view. Okay. Okay. So, so algebraic curves. Uh, am I sharing my my screen? Yes. Right. So you are seeing my slides, right? Okay. Not at the moment. Not at the moment. Okay. So, so let me just. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sips. Share. Okay. Okay. Just one second. One second. Yeah, uh, Marcos, since you, you, I don't yes. think you've ever given the seminar. This is very, very, very informal. So, uh, yeah, don't start yes, 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 yes. right away and stuff like that. Uh, uh, just one second, because I'm, I'm trying, I, I don't know, for some reason I cannot really share the, the screen. Uh, okay, now I should be able to do it. Is that, now it's okay? Now you see my screen? Yes, that was good. Okay, very good, okay, sorry. So, so what is a quantum curve? Well, standard algebraic curves are actually ubiquitous in modern mathematical physics. Uh, perhaps the simpler example is actually the, w, the WKV curve. So when you do the WKV method in standard quantum mechanics, in one dimensional quantum mechanics, you actually use algebraic curves to do calculations of semi-classical spectra. So this is like a very classical example, but uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, we have seen many problems in mathematical physics which are solved by using an algebraic curve. A famous example are cyber witten curves or supersymmetric gauge theories. Then uh, there are mirror manifolds to toric calabillaus which are actually encoded in curves. And this is one of the examples that I will mostly focus in the talk. Then when you solve matrix models at large chain, very often you see that the invasion of the model is encoded also in an algebraic curve. And also in the case of integrable systems, the spectral curves uh, play an important role in order to determine the classical and the quantum aspects of the integrable system. And finally, another example which has much discussed in the literature are A polynomials of knots. So, so in, in, in all these cases, uh, what happens is the following. Now, if you have a classical curve defined by an equation like this one, then you can use it to solve for p as a function of x, at least locally. And usually this defines, uh, this allows you to define a Liouville one form. So the form px times dx. And it turns out that the, in, in all of these examples, there is a classical theory, which is essentially solved by calculating periods of this uh, Liouville one form along the one cycles of the curve. So many of these problems are solved in this way. For example, in WKV, you compute periods to compute semi-classical spectra. In cyber witten theory, you compute periods to compute masses of VPS states. In mirror symmetry, you compute periods to compute uh, the three-level um, um, uh, prepotential of a string theory, of topological string theory, and so on. So uh, an example in which I want to focus in this talk is local mirror symmetry. So how this works, let me summarize a little bit this story. So uh, given a Tori Calabria manifold, so a Calabria manifold which is non-compact and which has uh, C star actions, uh, if you, you run the standard mirror symmetry procedure, you will find not a, a complex three-dimensional manifold, but actually a, a curve. I mean, you can encode all the information of the mirror of the mirror manifold in this case in a curve, which uh, is usually represented in terms of exponentiated coordinates. And it turns out that uh, 
if you calculate the periods of the Liouville form on this curve, you will be able to determine the prepotential of topological string theory on, on the original manifold X. So this is uh, essentially the version of a standard mirror symmetry uh, specialized to Tori Calabiaus. So let me give you a little bit more detail. So uh, imagine, for example, that you have a curve of genus one. If you want to fix ideas, you can think about one of my favorite curves, which is local P2, which has uh, this from here. And again, notice that uh, the coordinates here are naturally exponentiated. So this is a genus one curve, which has two uh, one cycles. And then uh, if, you, uh, if you calculate the periods of this little one form around uh, uh, the appropriate uh, uh, one cycles, you will get two different quantities. One is what defines the mirror map and gives you the Keller parameter of the Tori Calabiao, which in this case is the mirror of, of, of this curve here is log P2. And, and the other one cycle, the period of, of, of this Liouville one form around the B cycle gives you the derivative of a function F0 with respect to T. When you integrate this relationship and you expand in exponentials of E to the T, you get actually a generating functional of genus zero gram of weighting invariance. So you essentially solve uh, topological string theory at three level in this case by just solving this classical problem of computing these periods. So this is a case in which, this is a situation in which the this classical limit of the theory, in which this case is topological string theory, so the, the genus zero topological string theory is completely encoded in this simple geometric problem of calculating periods. And as I told you before, one of the first examples of the situation is WB, WKB approximation. The WKB approximation in quantum mechanics, this is what you do. You integrate the momentum around cycles in, in the curve defined by your Hamiltonian. And this uh, uh, gives you uh, essentially the semi-classical approximation. So in all these problems, we are doing some sort of WKB approximation. I mean, calculating periods always uh, uh, sounds very much like a WKB approximation to some quantum problem underlying the system. So it's tempting to think that every time you have a, a situation in which uh, the classical limit is computed by this type of periods, you can obtain quantum corrections to your problem by quantizing this curve in an appropriate way. So this is just a, an heuristic idea, an analogy. And in, if, you, if, you, if you want to make this more precise, for example, in the case of local mirror symmetry, this leads to this idea that uh, the natural quantum corrections in this problem, which in the case of Gromitian theory would be to compute higher genus free energies, so the higher genus Grom of Witten invariance of this problem. So the idea is that you should be able to compute this by quantizing the mirror curve in some appropriate way. So this, I, this idea was, uh, I think, in this form, uh, first uh, pointed out and, and put forward in a paper we wrote with Mina some time ago. Mm -hmm with Digraf, Albrecht Clem, and, and Baffa. And, and there we were essentially using this analogy that uh, if the genus zero is given by some sort of uh, period calculation, why, uh, why shouldn't we uh, try to calculate all the higher genus corrections to this problem, all these quantum corrections in string theory by doing some quantum corrections in a very simple quantum mechanical system. So this was, in a sense, the basic idea. Um, what I'm going to try to present you today is a, a, a way to try to implement this idea. So, so, so now imagine that you want to try to implement this idea and imagine that you want to actually try to compute uh, quantum corrections to a theory based on a curve. Okay, so what should you do? In a sense, uh, historically, in the last years, there has been essentially two different quantization schemes. I'm going to call these perturbative quantization schemes. So these are two machineries which produce, giving a curve, they produce for you a series of quantum corrections. Okay? And these are quite universal methods to do that. Mm -hmm. So, but there are two of them. So let me first tell you what is the first one. The first one is actually a method which mimics WKB. Okay? So in WKB, what happens is that you have a classical Hamiltonian, but uh, involving in one dimension. So you have X and P variables. 
Uh, the first thing you have to do, if you want to quantize the system, is just to promote these variables X and P to Heisenberg operators commuting to I times H bar. Okay. Now, once you do that, your curve can become, by using essentially the position representation for the Heisenberg commutation relations, uh, you can promote your curve to an operator. And this operator can be uh, thought as an operator which annihilates wave functions in the same way that the Schrodinger operator annihilates wave functions. And then you can try to simply solve such an equation in which the curve you started with is quantized in the sense that P now is a, a derivative operator and you want to annihilate a wave function. So you can try to solve this equation at least formally uh, in some way. Uh, here I'm, I'm not uh, taking into account issues related with ordering because many people will think, well, but what happens if there are ordering issues in your original curve? Uh, I will mention this, uh, I will be more precise about this uh, later on, but in many cases you don't have to be so careful with ordering issues. So let's suppose that you want to solve this Schrodinger type equation and uh, what you can do once you have a Schrodinger type equation, you try to use the W method. So the idea was that uh, these quantum problems are in a sense generic WKD problems. So we can try to use in this case, directly the machinery of WKD. And WKD tells you that the Liouville one form can be promoted to a quantum one form in the sense that by using an appropriate ansatz for the wave which is the Schrodinger equation, you can actually solve, uh, you can actually find a generalization of the momentum as a formal power series in H squared. So essentially you write the wave function as an exponential of the integral of the momentum. And if you want the function to solve the Schrodinger equation, the momentum will get these quantum corrections. But this is actually very good from the point of view of this problem uh, when you have periods. I mean, the classical problem was defined by periods. So if you now promote the momentum to a quantum version, to a formal power series in H bar, then you will promote automatically the integrals of this Liouville one form on the, on the cycles to a formal power series in H bar. So the periods that you were computing before will now get quantum corrections. So remember that uh, there was a period, uh, for example, in the case of, of local mirror symmetry, there was a period T uh, uh, which now will become a power series in H bar a square. And then there was this prepotential now, which uh, you can now uh, promote to a function of T and H bar. And by integrating instead of P, this uh, quantum version of, of, of the momentum. And this procedure was applied to, to local mirror curves and also to cyber within curve. Uh, in the case of cyber within, this was done by Mirnov and Morozov. And in the case of, of, of local mirror curve, which is the problem that we are interested in now here, was actually also done by, by Mina. So this was a paper with uh, Aganagis, Chen, Diagraph, uh, uh, um, oh, maybe an, 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 an uh, Aganagis, Chen, Diagraph, and Buffa, right? No, there was no claim here. Right? Sorry. So, so this was a paper in which they actually uh, they actually found this way of, uh, of quantizing mirror curves, and they found that uh, the, quant the classical periods can get promoted to quantum periods by using this procedure. So this gives you, uh, by the way, this gives you uh, these relationships that I introduced before define a quantum prepotential. So define a, a series, an infinite series of quantum corrections to the classical prepotential. So now you have a formal power series. Now the prepotential becomes a formal power series in H bar square. The order zero term is the classical prepotential and then you have all these quantum corrections. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is very nice and was very influential, at least for me, uh, but uh, it doesn't really recover the standard gromov witten theory. When you do this, you don't really recover the standard topological string. What you get is uh, some refined version of the topological string three energy, uh, one parameter deformation, which is uh, sometimes called the necrasso satasvili free energy. So this is a very interesting object, but it's not really the gromov witten theory. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a different deformation of the problem. So essentially, if you apply a standard quantization, you don't really get Gromov-Witten theory. 
you get something slightly different. In, in fact, I think we thought of this as a sort of, uh, if topological string has gravity, this doesn't have gravity, right? Uh, because this Nekrasov mm -hmm. really limit, which I think is involved here, is uh, essentially turns off uh, the bulk coupling yes. constant, right? So. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but in, in a sense, if you use this uh, WQB procedure, you will get, uh, uh, you will get uh, this very interesting object, which uh, it's very interesting, it's part of the story, but it's not exactly the remote theory. This is not a criticism, it's just saying that, uh, you know, the quantization gives you a different slice of what you want to calculate. Now, there is another quantization scheme, which is, and I put quantizations in, 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 in bars, because as you will see, it's not really a quantization. Uh, also, sometimes people call it quantization, but it's also a procedure which uh, essentially is a machinery which given a uh, curve will produce for you an infinite series of quantum corrections to the prepotential. And this is called the topological recursion of Ainara no Hamdan. And actually, this procedure does give you the topological string free energies. So this was conjectured by, by, by me and, 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 and by uh, Bouchard, and Albrecht Clem, and, and Sara Pasquetti. And it was eventually proved. So this gives you what you want, but uh, there is no really an obvious relation to conventional quantization. I mean, when you do topological recursion, you are not really quantizing in any standard sense of the word. Now, people that people who are in the in the clique of topological recursion want to solve this problem. I have been they have been working very hard in trying to relate topological recursion to some sort of quantization of the curve. So. So, for, so there was an uh, interesting result that in genus zero, uh, this topological recursion can be related to a quantization of the curve. But if you want to try, if you try to do this in higher genus for higher genus curves, then uh, uh, you can essentially produce some sort of differential operator that gives you uh, that leads to topological recursion. But this uh, uh, differential operator will have infinitely many quantum corrections. So, so the quantization is highly non-trivial in the sense that uh, uh, for every new term, that you, any new correction that you want to add to the prepotential, you will have to turn on a new correction in the curve. So essentially, it's not that predictive because there is no way of, of knowing a priori what is, the, what is the quantization you want to do before you get the result. In fact, I would say that this can't, can't make any sense, right? Because we don't start with a, with a classical geometry, then you know, turn on first one kind of quantum parameter and then quantize it again, right? It will be... Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, I don't find this... If, I mean, I find this a little bit um, uh, baroque, this procedure, in the sense that, uh, you see, I mean, is, 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 is a solution in searching for a problem, right? I mean, you want to match, uh, okay, you have topological recursion, it's a wonderful thing, but uh, why this should come from a quantization, right? I mean, if the quantization, and uh, of course you can do it because you can always write a complicated operator and if you keep uh, correcting it, you will get whatever you want, right? So uh, this is a little bit what happens. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, uh, and, and I have to say that there, the, the, some of these results are, are, actually, are actually nice. There was this paper by Iwaki, which is actually very nice. But again, I, I still don't feel that this is a very natural route. Okay. So I'm not going to follow this route in this time. But I, I wanted just to mention that people have tried harder to kind of relate topological recursion to quantization in some way, with this price to pay. Okay, so now, uh, Independently of, of, of this, both approaches are perturbative in nature, in the sense that uh, what you produce is a formal series, a formal collection of corrections. Right? Uh, let me recall that the, if you take all, for example, you take a standard topological string theory and you take all the genus G uh, free energies and you produce a formal power series in G string, which is uh, what a string theory produces for you, this formal power series does not define on the nose a function. And one simple reason is that if you fix the value of t, 
this is a factorial divergent series. So this FGE of T is grow like 2G factorial. And this is something that you have to face when you do perturbation theory and string theory. And already in physical string theory, this is something you have to, to live with. Um, topological recursion, for example, does not give you much insight on how to solve this problem because the only goal of topological recursion is to produce for you this family of FFTs, so uh, this collection of FFTs. So if you want to go be beyond uh, perturbation theory, uh, you have to do something else. And actually, if you, if you want to, if you actually want to have a quantum realization of topological string theory, you should really hope to get some sort of non-perturbative definition of the theory. And in a non-perturbative definition of the theory, this series should appear, this formal series that I was writing here, this series should appear as the asymptotic expansion of a well-defined function and nothing else. I mean, this uh, function should give you this, up to exponentially small corrections. So this is what a non perturbative definition should give you. And if you want to uh, kind of uh, do all before to pro promote uh, topological string theory to a quantum framework, uh, this is what you should expect. Now, um, I I'm going to tell you today about uh, one way we try to make progress in this direction. And essentially uh, the idea we had was uh, very simple. So essentially, the idea is that if you want to really go beyond perturbation theory, you have to take seriously the fact that uh, operators have to act in a Hilbert space. So that's that's as simple as that. Um, and so what uh, we we actually did was to take uh, the operator that you actually obtain from natural quantization, which since you are working one dimensions, is an operator in one dimension. So the natural Hilbert space for this theory should be just L to R. So the most elementary Hilbert space. And let me tell you from the very beginning that um, from, if you come from algebraic geometry, this is extremely unnatural to do. Because when you start doing a spectral theory of operators uh, kind of rigorously or seriously, then uh, uh, the, the spectral theory of operators is very sensitive, not only to reality issues, but even to positivity issues. I mean, this, this, the spectrum of an operator changes radically as you start changing the positivity and reality properties of its parameters. So from the point of view of algebraic geometry, which is the kind of natural point of view that we have when we do topological string theory, this is very unnatural because we are used to think that the parameters in our theory, in topological string theory, are just complex and, and they should uh, remain complex. But uh, so, so this could be an objection that you could have to introduce really in a strong way a Hilbert space in the game. But as you will see, you can start with a Hilbert space of this form, R to R, and then there are ways to complexify the problem afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I will explain this in a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I, I, I want also to mention that uh, if, you think about, um, if, out, if you think about all the curves that people have used uh, in the last years uh, uh, to solve all kinds of problems, it's obvious that when you quantize these curves in a natural way and you think about them as well-known operators and to R, you actually recover uh, well-known families of operators and you also recover like nice deformations of, of well-known families. So probably if you have uh, studied quantum mechanics, the simplest operators you can think are Hamiltonians, non-relativistic Hamiltonians of the form P squared plus a polynomial potential. Now it turns out that all these Hamiltonians can be obtained by quantizing cyber within curves associated to superconformal points. So you can think about ordinary quantum mechanics and some sort of quantization of the cyber within curve. Now, uh, if you think uh, of cyber within curve for Arguides Douglas theories, if you think about, for example, cyber within curves for SUN theories, which typically have this form, they have a, if you're writing in the way that uh, is natural from the point of view of integrability, these are like, uh, uh, have a uh, hyperbolic cosinus of P plus a, pot a polynomial potential in X. And when you quantize these curves, you obtain Hamiltonians, which are sort of natural deformations of the standard non-relativistic Hamiltonians, just that you have, instead of P squared, you have cos of P. So, so the quantization of curves from the point of view of a spectral theory is very natural. It gives you uh, operators that you can study with the tools of a spectral theory. And in a sense, the most interesting family is actually the one that you obtain when you look at mirror curves. When you uh, 
uh, mirror curse of Tori Calabilla, as I was telling you before, are, obtained, uh, are naturally expressed in terms of exponentiation of Heisenberg operators. Mm -hmm. So uh, here it's very easy to solve um, um, ordering issues uh, for the quantization by using what is called bile quantization, which is a standard. So bile quantization was actually invented in order to quantize exponentiation of Heisenberg operators. So when you do that, given any Tori Calabilla, you can actually produce a natural operator just by promoting X and P to uh, Heisenberg operators and, 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 and using this bile prescription for ordering. So for example, you take local P2, you will, uh, local P2, for example, you can think about it as this polyto which has three vertices. So you can see that each of these vertices will give you a monomial in this operator. So this is e to the x, this is e to the p, and this is e to the minus x minus p. And you can do all this game with all the operators, with all the, sorry, with all the polytopes that appear in local mirror symmetry. So you can form naturally operators in this way. Sometimes these operators involve parameters. For example, you have local p1 times p1 or local f0 which is the local Calabi-Yau constructors on the Hirsch-Zebruck F0 surface, you will get uh, an operator of this form and so on. And for simplicity in this talk, I will only consider um, polytopes uh, with a single inner point. So this means that I'm going to consider only um, mirror curves of genus one. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, uh, there is a very interesting story for higher genus, which uh, we work out in detail, but uh, it's just slightly more it's slightly more complicated, only slightly. So but just to fix ideas, I will focus on this type of examples. So, so, uh, so the main message is that just by standard simple quantization, you can get very interesting operators from the point of view of spectral theory. So, so local mirror symmetry, in a sense, gives rise to the quantum mechanics of bile operators, which are exponenti exponentiated uh, uh, Heisenberg operators. Uh, so, so this, this, these problems are actually natural generalization of one-dimensional Schrodinger operators. So for example, if you think about local P1 times P1, this operator here, you can think about it as a sort of uh, uh, hyperbolic deformation of the harmonic oscillator. So many of these uh, operators are very natural from the point of view of mirror symmetry, uh, oh, sorry, from the point of view of spectral theory, but the main question I want to address is the following. So if you study the spectral theory of these operators, is there any interesting relation with the geometric objects associated to the underlying curves? I mean, is there a precise relation between the spectral theory of these operators and the underlying topological string theory, or geometric theory, or gromov witten theory, or whatever? So this is one of the things that we try to answer, at least partially. And I will focus from now on on local mirror curves. Just to, I mean, th there is an interesting story with cyber within curves that I may mention at the end, but um, I will focus on local curves. Marcos, okay. Uh, yes. by, by spectral theory, you, you mean here like whatever mathematicians would do if you were to hand them this operator and try to tell them exactly. To so, out. what is the spectrum? What is the as you will see, we will need a slightly more, com more sophisticated objects, but yes, the idea is. These operators have a spectrum. I, I mean, if you, you, you do, um, you do WQV, you will produce uh, formal objects. But if you think about the spectrum, often these operators have a well-defined spectrum. And the question is, what kind of a spectrum they have? Is it discrete, continuous? Uh, what, what are the properties of, of, of this spectrum? And this is the kind of, yes. When mathematicians try to think about these, these kind of curves, I mean, the, the, the kind of operators that come from mirror symmetry and... Actually, after we wrote the papers, uh, some of them actually look at them. So Leon Tachtayan, for example, wrote a couple of nice papers on this type of operators and so on. So, and actually, one of the, 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 one of the things that was interesting is that expo oper exponentials of Heisenberg operators were actually much used in, the, in Teichmuller theory. So when people studied quantization of Teichmuller theory, uh, Kashaev studied these exponentiated operators. But all the examples he studied were, were operators with a continuous spectrum. And what is interesting is that the operators coming from local mirror curves are of the same type, but they are actually have a discrete spectrum, so they are compact operators. And this was, was, was very interesting because they were working with non-compact operators, and essentially local mirror symmetry gave some sort of compact version of the operators that they were using in, in, in quantum time theory. Okay, so, so 
again, so, so taking on what Mina was saying, the first thing that you should ask if, if you are a functional analyst is what, what is the nature of these operators? Do they have a continuous spectrum, a discrete spectrum? Uh, so what, they are, what, what kind of operators they are? Now, it turns out that uh, the, the, the best thing you can do with these spectrums, and this is also what happens in quantum mechanics, is to look at, 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 the, at the inverses. Okay? So the inverses of these operators, uh, so these operators are, are an unbounded, okay? all of them. So the trick of inverting these operators is that um, you can make an operator which is much nicer by inverting them. And it turns out that when you invert these operators, you obtain uh, something very nice. You obtain, in a sense, the best possible operators that you can find in quantum mechanics, which are called trace class operators. So the inverse of the operators that appear in quantizing local mirror curves are of trace class. This is assuming, here I'm making an assumption, assuming that H bar is strictly positive. And I'm also using some, assuming some mild conditions on some of the parameters that can appear here. So for example, in local at zero here, these parameters should also be real and positive for this, for this property to go through. But as I said, let me there do all first with all these constraints and then we will complexify later. Okay, but first let's try to think about these operators from the point of view of functional analysis. So as I said, they are trace class. So what, they, what this means is that this inverse operator has a discrete spectrum, but this means that the operator itself also has a discrete spectrum. This is a typical trick in fast analysis to prove discreteness of the spectrum. You show that the inverse is trace class, and then the original operator, also is unbounded, it will have a, it will have a discrete spectrum as well. And not only this, uh, uh, they have a discrete spectrum, but all their traces are finite. So these quantities here are going to be very important because uh, uh, they are going to be the building blocks of essentially of, they are going to be the building blocks in order to make contact with topological string theory again. Okay. So these, these are the kind of, uh, of, of properties of, for example, a density operator in quantum mechanics should satisfy. Mm -hmm. So some of these properties were conjectured by us, then they were proved. Uh, Renat Kasaev and I proved some, some of these properties for, for many cases. And then uh, Tachtayan, Lachter, and Schimmer also proved some of these properties in quite general cases. So essentially, the quantum mechanics of these operators is very interesting because they are of trace class. Okay, so you can actually uh, try to ask many questions about them. Now, another very important thing that happens to operators of trace class is that you can actually define a very important quantity, which is called the Frechton determinant. So the Frechton determinant of a trace class operator is essentially the determinant of one plus a given parameter kappa times the operator itself. So kappa, it's a, it's a parameter that appears here. And you can also write this as an infinite product involving the spectrum. And the most interesting property of this uh, spectral determinant or Frechtel determinant is that it's an entire function of kappa. Okay. And what is very interesting is that it's not very difficult to see that kappa here plays the role of the modulus of the Calabi-Yau. Remember that I'm focusing on Calabitas with one single modulus. So this object here gives you or three, an entire function on the Calabitas modulus space. So this function is really an entire function. It has no singularities. Uh, it's completely analytic everywhere on the modulus space. Um, finally, the final uh, ingredient that we'll need is that this Frechtel determinant, uh, since it's an analytic function, has a uh, Taylor expansion around the origin, around kappa equals zero. And this defines a quantity that depends on n, which is a positive integer, and on h bar. And these are essentially combinations of the traces that I was uh, defining before. And I will call them fermionic spectral traces. Uh, essentially, you can represent them as the trace of an operator on some sort of anti-symmetrized Hilbert version of the Hilbert space. But you can also think about them just as as the, the quantities that appear when you do the Taylor expansion of this entire function. So, so computing, I mean, once you have a trace class operator, the, the kind of the most ambitious thing you can do is to compute this spectral determinant. This is, and this is something that is very hard to do, and there are very few examples where you can do this. Uh, of course, you can do it in the harmonic oscillator. In the case of monic potentials in quantum mechanics, and there was this beautiful ODIM correspondence of Dory and Tateo, which allowed to compute uh, these spectral determinants by using 
relations to integrable systems and so on, but it's usually a very difficult problem to solve. So, but all these quantities are well defined uh, for, 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 for the operators that are obtained from, from mirror curves. Now, let me also mention that if you know the spectral determinant, if you know it, then you know the spectrum because the zeros of the spectral determinant give you the spectrum. It's very easy to see here in this definition that when kappa is minus e to the minus n, then this is going to vanish. So, so the, this is an entire function whose zeros are the spectrum of the operator. Uh, and you can, for example, you can compute this, say, for local P2, it has this shape, and you can see the zeros here. Now, this problem, uh, in principle, is completely similar to the one that Mina uh, and Miranda and, and Daniel Kreffel and, and Digraf and Buffer were studying. I mean, from the point of view of, 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 of uh, weak H-bar coupling, all these quantities should be related to the uh, NS topological string. I mean, in principle, you should be able to write uh, all these quantities in a weak coupling expansion around h bar equals zero in terms of quantities related to the NS topological stream by using this connection to WKB. Now, what was surprising for us was that uh, if you take the inverse limit, the strong coupling limit, then you can make contact with the conventional topological stream. And actually, in order to do that, of course, you need a non perturbative definition. You have to have really a total control over this operator because going to the strong coupling limit, you cannot do it in WKB. But once you have defined the spectral problem rigorously, you can compute everything in any limit you want. And the interesting thing is that it's very interesting that in, usual, in a standard quantum mechanics, there is only one universal limit, which is h bar going to zero. But it turns out that in this type of operators, the limit h bar goes to infinity is also described in a simple way. And what you find in this way is actually the standard topological stream, the one that makes contact with Gromov weighted stream. So I, I don't claim to have a deep understanding of this. So let me just state the results um, um, and, and, and then we can discuss more in detail why this should be like this. Now, in order to, uh, to formulate the, this uh, strong coupling result for this quantum mechanics, it's actually useful uh, to formulate this topological string theory in what I will call conical coordinates. Now, when you look at topological string theory in this, all these Calabillaos, their moduli space has a point, which is called the large radius point, which is the usual point in which you make contact with the counting of curves. So this is called the large radius limit. But there is a special point in the moduli space, which is called the conifold point, which is where the mirror curve actually degenerates and becomes singular. So, so there is a, a natural coordinate in the Calabria moduli space, which I'm going to call the conifold coordinate. Uh, and for this coordinate, uh, the vanishing locus of this coordinate is precisely this conifold point. So in principle, you can parameterize your topological string theory. You know, you can use symplectic uh, transformations to parameterize your topological string theory in any, in any um, coordinate you want. And in particular, you can parameterize uh, the mode space by the conifold coordinate, and you can uh, essentially formulate uh, the topological string in this conifold frame. So this is a little bit like doing an electric magnetic duality transformation in cyberwinter theory. Now, all this is because one of the results that we have in order to make contact with the standard topological string uses more naturally this thing. So, as I said, uh, the way to make contact with the topological string in this framework is to actually take the strong coupling limit in which h bar goes to infinity. So, remember that I introduced this fermionic spectral traces which depends on n and on h bar. So, the first conjecture we made was that there is a double scaling limit in which h bar goes to infinity, n goes to infinity in such a way that n over h bar is the conifold coordinate. In this limit, the spectral traces that you compute in quantum mechanics actually have a, a asymptotic expansion in inverse powers of h bar, and the coefficients of this expansion are exactly the topological string free elements. So, so in this context, notice that h bar plays the role of one of the radius string. So you recover the weak coupling expansion of the topological string in the strong coupling limit of the quantum mechanical problem. Okay. So this is the first uh, conjectural statement in which you actually recover the standard topological string from this quantum mechanical 
setting. Uh, some of you might not be completely happy because I'm using this conifold frame, which is not the most usual one, but you can also reproduce, you can also make contact with the standard uh, large radius frame in which you make contact with Gromov with the theory and so on. And uh, so let me let me first make uh, this statement. So in order to obtain the traditional Gromov with the free energies, you can actually look directly to the um, to the um, a spectral determinant. So remember that the spectral determinant depends on this variable kappa, which uh, I can write as e to the mu. So it turns out that now what you have to do is a double scaling limit in which mu goes to infinity, h bar goes to infinity, but mu over h bar is fixed, and this is the standard Keller parameter of the geometry. And then the spectral determinant itself has an asymptotics given by the standard gromov witten Free energies. Okay. Now, the reason why this asymptotics uh, I like it slightly less than the other one is that because this is an asymptotics which has oscillatory corrections. So, this happens sometimes in many problems that uh, you have a standard asymptotic expansion, but overimposed on this asymptotic expansion, you have some sort of theta function oscillations. Um, and this is what happens here. And this you can understand very well from this uh, plot here. Remember, this spectral determinant has to have an oscillatory uh, region, which is this one here, in which you get, in order to be able to get the spectrum of your operator. Actually, the scaling limit I'm, that I'm telling you about is the scaling limit in which kappa goes to infinity. So is this region here. So in this region here, the, the oscillations are very small, but still you inherit some oscillations from this part of the graph here. It's a little bit like the AD functions in which there is a region which is fully oscillating, but uh, you get some sort of remnants of oscillations uh, uh, in, 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 even in other regions. So, so that's why this asymptotics is slightly less convenient. Uh, now, let me actually also mention something for those of you who are familiar with uh, the volume conjecture. Uh, so the volume conjecture is a conjecture in, in three manifold topology, which tells you that some quantum invariants, like for example, the, the Jones invariant uh, evaluated as some uh, root of unity. When you take the limit in which uh, the H bar is very small, then this will, this will be controlled by a classical quantity of the model, which is the volume of the complement of the knot. Okay, so this is a statement in hyperbolic uh, geometry. Now it turns out that these spectral traces, these fermionic spectral traces that I was mentioning before, are very, very similar to state integrals for hyperbolic free manifolds. Or actually they are very similar to partition functions of, of, of supersymmetric theories. Now it turns out that there is a, a very interesting corollary of, of these conjectures, which is that if you take these fermionic uh, traces, hmm, and you take the limit in which h bar goes to infinity, they will actually uh, uh, decrease exponentially. And the quantity that controls this, uh, uh, this uh, exponential decrease turns out to be, in a sense, the volume of the Calabillao. So what is the volume of the Calabillao? Well, these are non-compact Calabillao manifolds, but there is a natural, um, a natural metric quantity which is the value of the color of the Keller parameter at the conifold point. You can think about this as the minimal volume of this Calabillao, because this is the value of the volume that you get, the value of the Keller parameter that you get, when you get uh, the Keller parameter as small as you can get it in the geometric phase. So it turns out that this quantity, the value of the Keller parameter at the conifold point, is what controls the asymptotics of these uh, fermionic spectral traces when n is fixed and h bar is goes to infinity. So in a sense, from this quantum invariant, you can extract a metric property of the Calabillao, which is uh, the value of the Keller parameter at the conifold point. So this is very, very similar to the volume conjecture in hyperbolic geometry, in the sense that a quantum invariant gives you metric information. And remember that these spectral traces are obtained just from operators obtained from the curve, yeah? but they have hidden in their in their, in their asymptotes, they have hidden information about the metric properties of the Calabria. So, so these are kind of more or less the, the conjectures that, uh, that, that, uh, that we made. 
Um, and as I said, we don't really have proofs of these conjectures. Uh, but uh, what, one interesting thing uh, is already to see uh, what they say these conjectures about, uh, about, about topological string theory. Um, and one surprising consequence of this picture is the following. I mean, anybody who has done calculations of, of topological string theory knows that these topological string theory energies have a complicated branch cut structure. Okay, for example, they have branch cuts, uh, they have branch points at the conifold point, and so on. So, so the so the the moduli space described by these three energies is a moduli space where there are singularities, branch cuts, and so on. But what is interesting from this conjecture is that all these three energies, all these quantities, we have all these cuts and so on, actually emerge as asymptotic expansions of an entire function. So the spectral determinant, the threshold determinant, is a completely entire function on the moduli space of the Calabi-L. And in a sense, you can think about, about all these branch cuts and singularities as artifacts of the asymptotic expansion. So it has been noticed many times that uh, in a full quantum stringy theory, all these branch cuts that appear are in, in string theory should be uh, artifacts of the expansion. So this is an example in which it happens. I mean, I, we don't have to overemphasize this because this is already the case in quantum mechanics. I mean, you do WKB, you see you have a, you have a potential, you have a curve, the curve is hyperelliptic, you have branch cuts and so on. On the other hand, you know that uh, the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, for example, you have a polynomial potential, are analytic functions on the complex plane. So this is always the same phenomenon. The WKV type approximations give you a, co a complicated complex structure and the full quantum theory has a very simple uh, analytic structure. No? So this is also happening here. Okay, um, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, so, so, so it sounds like you have something that interpolates between the nekrasov shatashvili limit and the topological string limit. Well, and has, and, has, and has no cuts, right? Yes. So, so, so what it sounds like is that what one wants to do is, uh, is, is take the, I mean, I, I think a lesson clearly over the last several years is that, um, is that the refined topological string um, while not defined uh, by <laughs> the formation of the ordinary topological string is a better object, right? Um, and, and, and I could, did, did you try to find some slice in the, in the, in the you know, epsilon T, epsilon Q parameter space, which would be your partition functions on the nose, like without taking any limits? I mean, this is kind of what it sounds like that, uh, you know, you want to relate epsilon to epsilons in some way, such that, um, you know, your parameter H bar going to one limit becomes not the really, the other limit becomes the ordinary topological string. Yeah, what but I maybe think, it just falls on, yeah, maybe, no, yeah. No, I think, I think in a sense it's the other way around, in the sense that what you can think is, is like, in a sense, these epsilon two and epsilon two parameters are not so independent, but they are related by some sort of S duality transformations. So it's like the PQ string, you see. I mean, the, these two slices, NS and, and ordinary topic string, are not two slices, are actually the same slice, but related by a S duality transformation. That's how I would actually uh, regard this. When you say it has no singularities, does it have sequences of poles? No, 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 no. Actually, it's, it's very, it's very uh, surprising how this cures, for example, the conifold singularity. The conifold singularity completely disappears in this threshold determinant. So, so there are no poles either? No, 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 nothing. Ah. Uh. Yeah. But of course, I have to say something. I have to say, and this is what I want to say, that mm -hmm. the, the full, the full uh, spectral determinant, I mean, what I mentioned so far are asymptotic statements over the, on, on the threshold determinant, right? right? Asymptotic behaviors when h bar goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. But when h bar goes to zero, you will get something related to, to the necrosotas with the limit and so on. Right. Now the question, one question you can ask is, can you actually compute exactly this spectral, this threshold determinant? And actually you can um, roughly, very roughly, what you have to do is, this is this formula here. It's a complicated formula, so I didn't want to, 
But essentially, what you have to do is you have to take the standard topological stream free energy, and you have to do uh, well. You have to do what is called a Zach transform, which is essentially a discrete Fourier transform. This has appeared many times before in the literature, but here it appears as an ingredient in, in reconstructing this right on determinant. And now to this quantity, you have to add in some um, clever way. So this is, if you want a standard topical string, and you have to add the necrosis of Asvili story. And these two things together will give you a well-defined spectral determinant. And in a sense, what happens is that the poles that this function has are going to cancel against the poles that this WK function has. Because one thing that actually was what put us on, on, this, on, this, on, this, uh, on this direction is that you, you see the, 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 the topological string and the necrosis of really free energies, they both have a dense set of poles when H bar is, is real. So there is an infinite dense set of poles on the real line of H bar. But there is no hint that the quantum operator obtained by quantizing the curve will have any singular behavior when H bar uh, for, for real values of H bar. Uh, so, so essentially, none of these things separately can actually solve this quantum problem because of all this dense set of poles, which, by the way, you don't see in four dimensions. When you go to the four dimensional limit, you don't see these poles. You only see them in the five dimensional limit. So essentially, you have to really use both uh, slices in order to regularize each other. And, and as I said, I I don't have a deep understanding of this. I don't have a deep understanding of this. In any case, this seems to be uh, the actual exact answer for this spectral determinant. So if you take H bar goes to infinity, the WKB part will decouple, and then you recover the standard topological string. If you take the standard H, going, H bar going to zero limit, the topological string decouples, and you get the necrosis of the story. So this is how this seems to work. Okay, so, so let me mention now, let me mention that a uh, couple of, of comments. You know, the first one is that what we are doing here is, is slightly different from what um, Necrosa and Satasvili did. Because Necrosa and Satasvili were mostly interested in, in obtaining uh, the solutions to to an uh, integrable system based on this curve. So, so they actually calculated the quantization conditions for the spectrum of an integral system. But here we are really quantizing curves directly. So what we are finding is the spectrum of the curve. So if you want, we are just finding the spectrum of the, of the Baxter equation, of the Baxter curve of the integrable system, which is different from the, in, uh, from the spectrum of the integrable system itself. Now, in genus one, both problems are identical. Quantizing the spectral curve and quantizing the integral system is the same because essentially the curve coincides with the Hamiltonian itself. But in higher genus, these problems are, are different. They are completely unrelated, but they are different. Basically, you cannot really solve the, the problem we are setting here, the quantization of the curve, but just by using the Necrasus as the quantization conditions, at least not, uh, not in an obvious way. Now, the second, the second comment is that uh, even in genus one, our solution of the spectral problem does not fully agree with, with the Carson Satasvili prescription for five dimensional theories. So, what we are saying is that there are non perturbative corrections to their quantization conditions. And, and this, we are, we are pretty sure that this is the case by, by many, many different calculations. So, actually, you take the Necarson Satasvili quantization conditions for five dimensional systems. As I said, when H bar is real, you will find. Uh, you will find um, uh, an infinite dense set of poles, which, uh, which doesn't make any sense. So something has to be added to, to what they wrote down. Because uh, already mm, in real, in, for real H bar, which is uh, perfectly fine from the point of view of the quantum problem, the answer has, uh, has this uh, infinite num infinitely dense set of poles which doesn't make any sense. Okay, so let me, uh, let me mention some applications in the last uh, five oh. minutes or so. Yes, be, be, yes. Before you go on, could you tell us a little more about this uh, ODE IM story, which you said is very nice and directly relates to your fractional de determinant? Yes. Uh, so, so this ODE IM story, um, okay. So, um, 
So this is something which is not directly related to, to what I'm doing. Uh, so uh, what Dorian Tateo found is that if you have a monic potential, a potential which is just, you know, P squared plus X to some power, say X to the four, if you, the spectral determinant for this problem can be actually computed explicitly by using some sort of integral type of uh, thermodynamic beta ansatz uh, system, okay? So they found this in sort of, uh, in sort of uh, uh, um, uh, experimental way. Now, in the last years, we have understood that what they did can be, uh, can be formulated in a kind of more powerful way using ideas of wall crossing and so on. So essentially, what happens is that uh, these monic potentials are actually, you can actually generalize it to, to arbitrary, arbitrary polynomial potentials. So essentially what happens is that these quantum periods that appear, that you do the AWKB problem for a polynomial potential in quantum mechanics, in terms of this, this quantum period that you study for local mirror symmetry, actually uh, have very simple crossing properties uh, as you move in the complex plane of H bar. And these uh, simple wall crossing properties are such that you can write down a system of integral equations in closed form, which is identical to the system of integral equations that Dorian Tateo wrote. So now we, uh, now we understand uh, this Dorian Tateo uh, integral system of integral equations as a consequence of wall crossing for the quantum periods of this quantum mechanical problem. And this actually eventually leads you to some sort of uh, nice uh, formula for this spectral determinant. Now, in principle, you could try to do the same thing here, but uh, it's much more difficult, much, much more difficult. Okay. Um, so so uh, just let me mention maybe a couple of things. Now, um, one thing, I mean, one thing that is interesting is that what you, you find is a structure here of this discrete Fourier transform in this formula. As, as I was mentioning, this sort of formula uh, appears very often. And I think the first time this formula was written in topological string was actually in the paper we wrote with me on the topological, um, on topological strings and interval hierarchies. We were also using some sort of Zach transform like this uh, in a different context, but we already noticed that this was natural. So, People have found that this kind of combination is natural in, in many contexts. And one nice context in which this is the case is uh, in the case of cyber witten theory. So people have found that you take the cyber witten all genus cyber witten prepotential of, of, of an N equal to theory, and you do this sort of uh, discrete Fourier transform in the same way that I was mentioning before, you get actually tau functions of pan levy equations. So this was found by Gamma Jung, uh, Yorgo Faldisovi in a very, in a very nice paper. And, and actually, of course, this resembles very much uh, what we have been doing. And actually, you can even be more precise. You can actually take a four-dimensional limit of all, everything I have been telling you and actually make contact with such a tau function. Uh, and actually, you can in, reinterpret this tau function as a spectral determinant of an operator on, on the real line. So this was done by my former student, Al Bagrassi, with Bonelli and Tanzini. Um, and it's a nice uh, construction because it gives you a, a really a quantum mechanical interpretation of these pan level functions, these pan level tau functions. Now, another question that I'm going to mention a little bit is, is complexification, right? I mean, I'm, maybe the only, I mean, we have complexified the modules of the Calabiao because remember this threshold determinant is an entire function on the, on the moduli space of the Calabiao. But what about H bar? H bar have always assumed that it's real and positive. And many people will object very deeply to this because they think why, you know, in, you know and, and not, I don't have to be attached to any reality condition. So, so we should be able to complexify H bar. And for example, if you think about these world crossing stories, it's always very natural in quantum mechanics to complexify H bar and see how things change when you rotate H bar in the complex plane. You can find very interesting physics and mathematics. Now, in this problem, it turns out that there is a very natural way to do this. Uh, this again, it's not a first principle way, it probably can, can be improved, but it turns out that when you actually do calculations of these operators and you calculate their integral kernels in order to do calculations, you find 
that the integral kernels of operators coming from mirror curves involve in a very crucial way Fadeyev's quantum line logarithm, what is some people call the non-compact quantum line logarithm. So this is a function of B of X with uh, labeled by a parameter B. And it turns out that B is square is related to the H bar of the problem. So the quantum line logarithm of Fadeyev has this beautiful property that, uh, that you can define it, uh, uh, you can actually extend its definition to the full complex plane of B squared, right? except maybe uh, the negative real axis, okay? So, so using this fact, you can actually analytically continue everything I have telling you, even from the point of view of quantum mechanics, even all these spectral traces and so on, you can actually analytically continue to the complex plane of H bar and this is actually very beautiful because then you can use all the technology that people have developed in order to understand, uh, you know, for example, the state integral invariance. And then you can reformulate many of these partition functions of topological string theory in terms of uh, Q series, like the ones that appear in, in three manifold topology. You can study their, their properties and their wall crossing in the complex H plane and so on. So even if we started with a construction based on spectral theory in which everything was real and positive, you can eventually, at the end of the day, you know, give up all these constraints. The first one is that the energy doesn't have to be, the energy, if you want, of, of, the, of this uh, spectral problem doesn't have to be real because at the end you work with this threshold determinant, which is fully complex. And then even H bar at the end can be complexified and can be taken to be uh, a, a, a complex variable, okay? So in, in, from that point of view, uh, our original bet that we should try to impose uh, Hilbert space in order to be able to define the theory non-perturbatively, this doesn't really uh, make you, uh, gives you any limitations from the point of view of, of, of geometry. So you can always become complex again. Okay, so, so let me just mention some open problems. Uh, so, what I have presented is, 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 is a quite precise duality in the sense that uh, you can actually relate very precisely calculations in spectral theory, the spectral theory of trace class operators. Uh, you can relate it in a very precise way to, this, uh, to, to the conventional topological string. And in a sense, you can mix both the topological and the necrosotas really limiting a single object, which is perfectly well-defined and so on. And in particular, you can this gives you a well-defined non perturbative definition of the topological stream partition function in the sense that the topological stream free energies appear naturally in an asymptotic expansion so from a well-defined object so you could define you could calculate the partition function of topological streams for uh, any value of the string coupling constant and any value of the top parameter as numbers not just asymptotic expansions now what i think is really lacking is a more physical understanding of this duality and one, 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 one finds is that uh, when, when, when one works out the details of this, of this mathematics, one finds that there are many relationships with many different things. For example, the whole theory smells like there is a, some sort of three-dimensional supersymmetric theory behind all this. For example, these partition functions uh, scale like n to the three halves, like uh, a supersymmetric uh, uh, gauge theory in, a dual to an ADS uh, for theory booth actually scale. So uh, the partition functions are similar to the integers that people compute localization. So there is also a, a lot of, I mean, formally this also is identical to a, a one dimensional Fermi model. So you can reformulate all these things in terms of uh, one dimensional fermions whose potential is defined by the Calabillao. So you can work out all these details, but we don't really have a first principle of physical understanding of, of, of this, of, of why this works. Okay? Uh, and we would really like to make this more concrete. Now, uh, mathematically, uh, I th most of the conjectures we've made mathematically are, are very clear. I mean, they are very sharp. Uh, you can test them, you can, uh, but I think they are very, very hard to prove. No? And again, there is even this sociological problem that it's very hard to find uh, mathematicians who know both sides of the conjectures. I mean, there are people who know spectral theory usually don't know about Gromov-Witten theory. And 
once I, once I was giving a talk at uh, the seminar by Raul Pandaripande in Zurich and about this, and he told me, this is the first time that somebody mentions trace class operators in my seminar. <laughs> so, so, so there is also an issue that, you know, we are mixing different qu quantities that, you know, two different words that, you know, that people are not used to, to mix together. But uh, the conjectures are actually perfectly well defined and, and basically should be able to prove them. But I think it's going to be very hard. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marcos. Um, are there questions? Can you say, uh, okay, I have a question, if nobody has a question. Can you say a little more about, uh, so, okay, firstly, uh, if for higher genus, do you expect commuting Hamiltonians, or what, what happens for higher genus when you have more, more energy operators? Well, what do, you really only have one Hamiltonian. That's one of the key themes of this thing. Uh, there is no, uh, the, the curve, you have to quantize the curve itself. So when you quantize this curve, sometimes it's convenient. The way we did it, we, we find it convenient to introduce different operators, but they are related by conjugation and you are really working in one dimension. So that's the main difference. So what do I choose as, the, as sort of the, uh, what will I call the energy there? Uh, is there... I mean, are, for genus one, there was a natural choice, like the size of the hole, but... Absolutely, absolutely. There are going to be many parameters. There are going to be, so for example, you take genus two, uh, stand, you know, typically you will have two uh, complex parameters, two moduli, and there is a version of the threshold determinant, which we actually constructed based on what people have done in, in which is actually a spectral function of both, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and, and the entire function of both moduli, okay? So, so, you know, let me just, just, to, just to give you an idea. So imagine that you compute, imagine that you quantize the cyber width and curve. Now, you quantize the cyber width and curve, say for SU4, you will have a Hamiltonian, which is two cos of P plus some sort of quartic polynomial. Now, it's clear that this Hamiltonian has just one single spectrum. I mean, it's a quartic potential with a deformation of P squared. It's, it, you know, it clearly has a discrete spectrum, but it has a single spectrum. Now, if you were going to do a SU4 integrable system based on the SU4 cyber with curve, you would have uh, three commuting Hamiltonians and you would have a, an spectrum, you know, for the total chain for SU4 and so on. So what we are actually interested in is in calculating the spectrum of this single Hamiltonian, which is like quantizing the Baxter curve of the TODA system. So our problem, our spectral problem is different from the one that you would find in, in, in integrable systems. Uh, but it's still a well-defined problem and you can study, you can try to solve it and so on. Uh, now, one interesting thing is that the spectrum of the integrable system that you would naturally associate to a genus two mirror curve, see this kind of fog Gonchar, uh, Gonchar of, uh, what a Kenyan Gonchar of Kenyan system, uh, would be a, mm, uh, a, a, a special set of points in the spectrum of this Hamiltonian that we study. So if you look at, at the spectrum of this Hamiltonian, this is, uh, this is a spectrum depending on, on many parameters. So it's a the quantization condition is for dimension one in modular space, but there will be a special set of points corresponding to this uh, integrable system. But we're actually solving a different spectral problem. We are quantizing the Baxter equation itself, not the integrable system itself. If you want to get the spectrum for the integral system from the spectrum of the Baxter system, you need typically many constraints. You have to constrain a lot your spectrum. Well, we actually use the minimal constraint, which is that our wave function should be integrable, a square integral. When you solve the integrable system, you want, to your, you want your wave functions to decay really very fast. And this imposes strong conditions in order to have a, a, a well-defined spectrum. So our, our quantization conditions for this kind of Hamiltonian is much more relaxed than the ones that you would use in integrability. But you cannot solve our spectral problem with, with the solution of the integrable system. I mean, it's not that you can deduce one from the other. 
So you give me the solution of the total hierarchy for SU4, I cannot really solve this Hamiltonian. Just with that information, I cannot do it. It's a, in the, it's a different in, uh, spectral problem. And there's no way to introduce an additional parameter in the story? Uh, uh, yes. Well, you, you actually, you actually, you know, in your paper with, um, in your paper on, on, on quantum geometry, you actually mentioned that, you know, a time deformation should do the job, right? If you want to introduce... Uh, you know, the, 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 the later papers we wrote um, realized basically that for a long time, we were trying to understand geometric transitions of topological strings and so forth. Uh, and how, sorry, how does this generalize to define topological string and what does it mean? Okay. And then we realized that it means something and what it means is way better than any kind of relation we ever had in ordinary topological string. But it means something in gauge theories. All mm -hmm. these geometries come from five dimensional gauge theories. They're associated three dimensional gauge theories, which live with vortices. And the relation between them is, uh, it's not asymptotic, it's completely crisp. Um, it's, it's in some sense m much, much, much sharper than, 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 than what happened in ordinary topological string. So, so somehow it feels that your sharp story and that story should in some way be connected. But the other story very crucially involves two parameters, both, both, both epsilons yeah. and not just, uh, not, not just one. Um, and so... Yeah. Um, but but what you get is that, uh, for example, uh, the, the the theories on on sort of topological debris, the refined topological debris, are three dimensional gauge theories. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that 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 you get for for free. Um, at the same time, yes. Uh, and one can consider probes, which where you would get. Uh, analogous, I guess, equations to what you're writing. But um, there are always two epsilons and one epsilon is quantum mechanical and the other is a parameter. It's like a, you know, a flavor, to mm -hmm. some, some, some R symmetry, um, focacity or something. It's a bit different, but. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's, it sounds like a totally fantastic story here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, we, we, I mean, um, yeah, uh, there might be a relationship. There might be a relationship because, as I said, you know, we keep uh, we keep stumbling on, on things which look very much like, for example, three D uh, supersymmetry gauge theories, right? So, but you see, uh, one thing that would be very, I mean, for example, you know, for local P two, you can write uh, these spectral traces and they look like SUN theories, like three dimensional SUN theories. Uh, but you know what would be very interesting would be to try to kind of construct this from first principles. So given Torricala via manifold, what is the three D theory with you on the, the nose? These spectral traces. Actually, yeah, no, that, very... that, that that feels very different because I, I I would have no way from P two to get you an S U N gauge theory in yeah. any natural way. Um, um, I mean, uh, that, that story where, you know, relation with gauge theories comes from some, you know, kind of degenerate. Ah, so what happens when your curves degenerate, like at singularities? If you have, what, what happens to, uh, uh, to, the, to the energy spectrum? Uh, well, usually, for example, you know, usually, for example, the conifold value, the conifold value of the, of, 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 the, of the modulus is the lower bound from the spectrum. So you really never get uh, beyond the conifold point very often. So, so in a sense, you know, in a sense, you cannot, uh, you know, you cannot uh, tune the modulus at your will. The modulus is the energy. So given H bar, you will find a spectrum and then the lower bounds on the spectrum <coughs> always over the value of the, of, over the will always be such that the curve is never singular. So, so you want the lower bounds on the energies is always bigger than the conifold value of the of the modulus. But it's not you cannot really change the, the the energy is quantized. So the moduli are quantized when you look at the spectral problem. I see. So you um, you're saying that if you if for for large energies. 
for large n, say for P2. You say the scaling behaves like a scaling of a 3D gauge theory? Is yeah, the, 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 ZN, the ZN, that depends on the scaling regime you use. So you fix H bar and you take, you see there are three, there are three scaling regimes for these spectral traces, right? So, 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 so you take this double scaling limit in which N goes to infinity and H bar goes to infinity so that this is fixed, then you have this topological stream behave, right? Now, if H bar goes to infinity and N is fixed, you have this kind of volume conjecture regime. And if H bar is fixed and N goes to infinity, then this goes like E to the N to the three halves as in a standard N to brain theories. And this is universal for all these models. So this behaves like an M to brain theory actually for any Calabillao essentially. That's why it looks very much like there is some sort of 3D theory behind lurking on, on behind all this. I see. So, so you want to interpret this at fixed n as as, as somehow having some number n of brains in a P two. Yeah. But uh, yes. in M theory or in string theory? Well, oh. two being M theory, right? N to the three halves. This is what you would get in M theory. So this is when H bar is fixed. So this is the scaling. This is the scaling that you would get in a string theory. And you know, H bar fixed N large, that would be the scaling of M theory. But of course, all these quantities are, are spectral traces of a quantum operator. I mean, these are, uh, these are just obtained by expanding the threshold determinant. So that's why we don't really have a very uh, obvious uh, gauge theory interpretation. In principle, you have this operator, you compute the spectral determinant, it's, a, it's an entire function, and then you span it and you get these, thing, these, these objects. Now, what, we, what happens is that when you actually want to compute these objects, what uh, Renat and I did was to actually di diagonalize the operator explicitly, and then you can write this uh, Zx as a matrix integral, as a, some sort of finite dimensional integral. And then it looks very much like the kind of object that you would obtain in a three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory by localization. And uh, it's not, uh, I see. Hmm. Yeah, this is something that we have to understand better. I mean, because there are all these analogies, but uh, we are lacking some sort of physical heuristics that derives all these operators from, from some sort of more physical setting. But it's very, it's very hard to implement this duality, this sort of H bar going to infinity and H bar going to zero in, 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 by using a standard dualities. I mean, it's, uh, it's not so easy. But, but it sounds like it, it will, that this somehow has to connect to having, say, N M5 rings, right? On and M2, I would say, yeah. That would be like well, M2. But, but there, is there any story for, say, local P2? Uh, sorry, <laughs> local P1. <laughs> well, local P1, that's a very good question. So what happens with local P1? Now, if you try to local P1, so all these genu zero geometries are actually, from the point of view of a spectral theory, they don't have a good spectrum. They right. don't give class operators. So what you can do is to, to consider them as limits. So you take a, a, you take a, you take a, a geometry, uh, which is uh, genus, uh, high genus, and then you take a special limit in which you recover this genus zero curve. But we cannot really do, do genus zero curve with, in this setting in a direct way because we don't have trace class operators. So you need a, it's very funny because, you know, usually you would think that genus zero is very easy, but right. here actually genus zero is actually complicated because you essentially, what, what makes the operator compact is the presence of, of compact four cycles. You see? Yeah. And if you don't have compact four cycles, uh, then, you know, the operator is not going to be trace class. So trace class operators need at least genus one curves or, or higher. 
you can do it. Actually, my former postdoc at Suda actually wrote a very nice paper in which he actually looked at local P1 dash P1 as a limit of at the generated limit of a, of a trace class operator. And then he got very nice results, but, uh, but that's a limit. A local P1 times P1? Yes. Doesn't this not, no, no, I mean, no, isn't this no. one of your canonical examples? No, 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 local P1 times P1 is okay. I mean, uh, sorry, um, resolve conifold. I mean, O minus, o, o, minus, o minus one plus O minus one over P1, sorry. Yeah. So he did the resolve conifold as a limit of a trace class operator. But uh, genus zero is, is actually not easy to do here in that sense. I mean, actually, it actually makes contact with this quantum Daimler theory because the operator that you get from resolved conifold is the kind of operator that people were looking at in quantized Daimler theory with a continuous spectrum, not with a discrete spectrum. Interesting. Um. But 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 if if the story was about M two brains, then then um, you know local geometries and compact geometries would not be all different. Um, yeah yeah no. Actually, the, I, you somehow have to. I think something like an M five brain has to play a role. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, but, I'm, you wrote this nice paper where you were associating you know M two brain theories to Calabillas, right? Uh, Oh yeah, this was this right. This was the story of. Uh, so, so I thought that maybe, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 maybe I thought that this could be related, but um, it's not exactly the kind of geometry. It's not that's yeah. really not exactly what one needs. Right. Mm. <clears throat> And, and again, I, sorry, so I, I keep asking this. You, you don't see a way to, to add another parameter, like have, having, so this extra parameter, I think, should just probably enter your spectral curve as a parameter. I, I think that's right. No, actually, what is interesting is that if you look at what people are doing in topological recursion, uh, they, they, you know, you, you roll this quantization of the curve which you have a time derivative so sort of derivative when you have both parameters epsilon one epsilon two then you have like time dependent hamiltonian and so on and people doing topological recursion which are trying in a sense going from the other way they are trying to to interpret topological recursion as a quantization they are also something getting something like an extra parameter t and so on but um yeah, but the story gets, uh, I mean, this, that, that would be very interesting to pursue. That would be very interesting to pursue. But in a sense, um, also, this is also telling you that uh, you have to be careful because there is some sort of S duality symmetry in the space of epsilon one and epsilon two. So, so if you introduce two parameters, then, you know, the weak coupling and the strong coupling limit of, of, of you know, you take, a, cap, a, a pair of parameters and you take the weak coupling limit and the strong coupling limit, then you will find relationships among them, right? In the same way that, you know, H bar here, when H bar goes to zero, plays the role of, of, of epsilon one. And when H bar goes to infinity, plays the role of the inverse of the string. So, so, so the same parameter, depending on where you are in weak or strong coupling, can change the slice of this uh, refined topological string story. So, so I think the, the, maybe the better way of thinking about this is uh, that these two parameters is, uh, well, sorry, so in some context, the way to think about them is there is one parameter, which is like, um, um, I guess maybe coming from Leoville and so forth. It's a, it's, 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 it's like Q. So in some language, it's like one over B plus B, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, um, so I think that that sounds like your H bar. Mm -hmm. But then there's another parameter, which is, um, in, which is, if that's a conformal theory, then there's another parameter corresponding to breaking conformal invariance. And if, you know, if, um, if stories about conformal and, and five brains are, um, um, depend only on this parameter Q, like big Q, which is one over B plus B, 
mm -hmm. or minus b. So that the spe so so topological string limit is is uh, is 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 q is equal to zero, and and then uh, Necker Schwarzschild would be q to infinity. Then mm -hmm. uh, so so then like um, five dimensional gauge theories and things like that, they all have one more parameter which should really be thought of as breaking conformal invariance. In other words taking from a theory of, of M5 range, which is conformal to uh, like little string theories, which are not of two zero types. So I, I don't... Um... Yeah, the problem is that you have to try to realize all these in a quantum mechanical model, right? You know, you have to do, I mean, it's not that you have to do it, but... So maybe speed... you only have, I see. The speed of course, is to, uh -huh. to reduce uh -huh. it to a sort of one dimension, right? Quantum mechanics. Let's see. And, um, mm -hmm. I still think that your original proposal in your paper on quantum geometry is actually worth pushing. I mean, what happens if you have some sort of time derivative and, and you have some sort of flow in time? Uh, of course, you have to think about uh, how, you know, you have to rethink a little bit how you want to parameterize this and so on. But I think this is still very worth to pursue. And this fall is, you know, yeah. from a quantum mechanical point of view. At the same time in your story, right, you, you really do get like full quantum topological string, like a like closed string. Necker's yeah, yeah. really is like an open string, but you get a closed string too, and you, you are able to interpret it between them, which, yes, which, yes. which is something we did. This is, this is not how, how, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, story arose for us in, in, or this was not natural in, 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 that, in that story of that paper. And this um, was actually by, by total chance that we just uh, fell on, upon this, you know, this, this was just because in ABGN theory, something like this happens. And, you know, this was, this was very surprising. So in ABGN theory, essentially what happens is that the genus expansion is the standard topological string. And then we, when we were studying non perturbative corrections in ABGN theory, we found that this was given by these quantum periods that you have computed. Um, and then, you know, in ABN theory, actually, this, this actually happens. I mean, the, the, the standard genus expansion is controlled by the standard topological string, and then membrane instantons, which are M2 grains, are controlled by, by this uh, quantum necrosophos story. And then this suggested that these two things should be part of the same game. And that's okay. How. Can you can you then spell out what? Uh, how would we go from this story to ABGM? Like, or how did you get from ABGM to this? Which curve would the, should we be studying? Which geometry? So in ABGM, essentially, the ABGM theory. You want to study. ABGM, I mean, again, this is uh, something that I think uh, nobody has ever found a deep reason for this. But ABGM theory in in the genus expansion is completely equivalent to the topological string on local p one plus p one. Okay. That was the, how, you know, that was what emerged from analyzing this ABJM matrix model of Kapustin and company, right? So you just look at this matrix model, it's just local point plus P1. And, and then, you know, if you, want, if you now try to compute uh, non perturbative corrections to this matrix model, then you will find that they are given by Nekrasso Satashvili string on local P1 plus P1. And then, you know, already in ABN theory, you have that the perturbative sector and the non-perturbative sector involve both the standard topological string and the refined topological string in the NS limit. So this is how we found that these two theories are not disconnected, but are connected by, by weak and strong coupling limits of the same theory. And remind me, in that story, uh, the ABGM model was supposed to describe M2 grains on, on what? On ADS4 times S7. I mean, sorry, I mean, uh, on, I mean, uh, this is after, uh, after the geometric transition, right? I mean, uh, you start live with... Uh, so basically, C on yeah, flat space. Yeah, C2 mods AK and so on, right? <coughs> so... 
so this is what gives us the idea that these two things should be uh, part of the same story. But again, you know, this is just a kind of game of coincidences uh, with no deep, uh, no deep uh, uh, structure behind. I mean, uh, the mathematics is very clear and it all fits very well. And you can treat all, you can treat A, B, and C and topological strings in the same kind of. So, for example, this z x, this uh, partition function z x of n and h bar, this is what in ABN theory would be uh, the matrix integral of the partition function on S3. So, so all, everything that I described here has a co correlate in, 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 in the theory of, in, in ABN theory. Okay, yeah, now no, I appreciate why you say I'm two brains, okay. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. But again, you know, I don't have any deep uh, duality or deep uh, construction which justifies this. These are just, uh, say, formal uh, structures that uh, work very well, but uh, but are not do not have a first principle explanation. And, and in the ABGM story, the n would be the number of M two brains. Absolutely. And, and and so did I'm sure you try to find uh, <laughs> system. Okay, so if M two brains and flat space are P one times P one, then M two brains on X are others. Have, have you, 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 you sure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like but, do orbifolds uh, of P1 times P1, does that work? Yeah, 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 but no, no, no. The problem is that uh, when you, I mean, if you try just to do the physical three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theories, the correspondence with topological studies essentially breaks down. I mean, there is no other case in which you can do that. I think there is a peculiar, uh, there is an ABN theory on some special, uh, um, uh, how do you call this the formation of the sphere right this be uh, the formation of the sphere there is one case in which you can relate this to local p2 for some special value of h bar and so on but there is no general story for in which you can kind of push this analogy it's just that the formal structures are the same and essentially you can what we did here was to reformulate the polygon string theory based on this idea and eventually this all boiled down to this uh, quantization of this operator. So, you know, you, we, didn't need, we didn't have to, to, to kind of construct a three-dimensional theory in order to calculate these spectral traces. Just the quantization of the curve was enough to do that. But the, the rest of the structure is identical to ABJM theory. Uh, yeah, so, so sorry, you mentioned this, but I didn't quite understand. So uh, replacing the S3 by this squashed S3, would that yes. give you uh, an additional parameter here in some natural way or not? Well, not really, because again, um, well, it would give it to you maybe in local P1 and P1, which is the case in which you can make the contact. That, that would be, yeah, that would be at least a case in which this could be done. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that I completely agree. If you did that, in, in ABN theory, then you would get a natural deformation of local P1 plus P1. Okay. But again, you know, uh, there is no other 3D supersymmetric gauge theory which is fully described by a topological string except ABAM. But, but surely orbifolds of it would be, right? I mean, we can orbifold flat space and... Yeah, well, I think, yeah, I think some, yeah, there are some... Something. People like Moriyama have tried to push this and try to find, you know, some kind of special examples where this can be done. So that's an isolated example, but there is no general story. Okay, so, so somehow it's not the right route. Yeah. There is a question in the chat. Uh, oh. I do not know if you can see it. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, let me see. Uh, chat. Yes. Yes. Uh huh. Well, so it's, you know, it, they're asking what uh, something more about this volume conjecture, how is this is related to my remarks about ADS CFT. Uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, sorry. So the volume conjecture again is in a slightly different limit from the ABS CFT because here is n is fixed and then h bar goes to infinity. So actually there is there should be an n here, but this is just a, 
an overall factor of n here. So, um, so it's a, in principle, it's a definite scaling limit. Now, if you take the M theory limit of a, you know, which would make connection with ADSCFT, you would get this scaling of like N to the three half. So these are different scaling limits. Uh, now this uh, volume conjecture looks more like, uh, like an, an analog of, of what people do in the context of state integrals. Um, now, the question if this is a higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds, uh, that I don't know. Uh, that's more like a, a conjecture about uh, Tori Calabillaos in the sense that uh, in the sense that you can actually uh, you, let me actually say, say, tell that uh, from this conjecture we could actually predict uh, some of these values of the Keller parameters at the conical point. So, so this is actually has predictive value and and actually uh, Matt Kerr, uh, who is a mathematician, did the very, uh, and Charles Doran, these very highly non-trivial calculations in K theory, which could actually check our prediction. So this conjecture is, is not only seems to be true, but it's actually predictive. Uh, it's actually useful in order to predict uh, the values of this, uh, of these Keller parameters at the particular point. And I have to say that this is also very similar to three-dimensional manifolds in the sense that this, for this story Calabillaos, this, these volumes of Calabillaos are always given by, in the cases which we could work out explicitly, they are always given by uh, special values of the polylog, of the dialog at, uh, at say, roots of unity or things like that. So, for example, for local P2, the volume is actually the volume of the figure A naught. <laughs> but this is just, again, it's just uh, some... Um, some, something that uh, appears from the mathematics, but we don't have any uh, a priori understanding. And, and are there any references for that first paragraph on the slide? Uh, which one? This is specific calculations? Are very of... similar? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is my paper with, my paper with Kashaev. In my paper with okay. Kashaev, we actually express these traces in terms of the quantum dialog, and we use technology from, from state integrals to actually calculate these traces. Some of these technologies, and now, in, now I'm working with G.E. Wu in, in trying to understand this, uh, these spectral traces from the point of view of, of Q series. So you can actually, you, uh, you can actually re-express all these uh, topological stream partition functions in terms of Q series, and then you find some sort of hidden integrality uh, for, for these partition functions. But the paper with Kashaev explains, mm -hmm. uh, explains how the quantum dialog uh, appears in the game. And then, you know, the, the, these traces, which are integrals, uh, can be written as something that is very similar to state integrals. Thank you. And, and you know, you were mentioning mathematicians who uh are at the uh, intersection of spectral theory and gromov witten theory. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you probably know this very famous mathematician. His name is Don Zagier. So yes. if, if you, yeah, it, I think Zagier would know both theories. <laughs> so yes. you could try talking to him. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I already talked to him about some of the things that we found. Uh, because this also involves modular forms, which is also one of the specialities of, of Zagier. So, so for example, uh, this, uh, th this object here, uh, although it doesn't look like, is actually very much like a theta function. So it turns out that there are, yeah. special, values, there are special values of H bar for which this actually becomes really identically a Riemann theta function. And then uh, the spectral traces you to special values of this theta function in specific points. And so, so this is Sagir's uh, domain. So we also so, discuss with him about that. So in that case, what happens to the WKB? That term, the, the thing oh, on the right hand side? It's very interesting. There is a value of H bar, which is uh -huh. the value of H bar, which is invariant under H bar going to 4 pi squared over H bar. So this is H bar equal to 2 pi. When h bar is equal to 2 pi, the theory, all these spectral traces and all these spec, this Fresco determinant essentially simplifies drastically and only gets corrections from F0 and F1. So essentially only string theory up to one loop. And then the WKB part also simplifies enormously. And then you can write this in closed form. 
And this, by the way, again, with the similarity with 3D theories, this is what happens to uh, supersymmetric theories uh, like ABGN theory when k is equal to 1. When k is equal to 1, the theory is maximally supersymmetric, and then the theory simplifies enormously. And h bar equal to 2 pi for all the historical abijaus is a special value in which the theory simplifies enormously. And then you can uh, essentially write all these things in closed form. So there is sort of awesome. mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, do we have more questions? Okay, Marcus is, is calling in from Europe. So in Europe, it's very late now. Yeah, um, it's <laughs> <laughs> so, so if we don't, if there are no more immediate questions, then maybe we should thank Marcus uh, for, for joining us and for the wonderful talk. And uh, this, this, this remains exciting. <laughs> um, Thanks a lot. Tina. Thanks a lot for the for the invitation. It was really great to to be able to talk to you today. Yeah. All right. It's it's really great for, that you came and, and 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 talked to us. Thanks, Marcus. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye. Bye-bye.